Hey guys, uh, I hope you had a wonderful weekend and I hope you're off to a really good start this week. Uh, happy Monday to you. This is the class that uh, in the syllabus we should be on uh, the lesson covering Gethsemane today, but we're a little bit behind because of everything. So what I'm going to try to do today is, is make up two lessons. The one from March 16th and March 18th. So we're going to do triumphal entry, cleansing the temple, cursing the fig tree, and then the final night in the upper room, the Kidron Valley, and the intercessory prayer. We're going to be skipping some things, obviously, in order to make uh, make up some of that time. The first video that I did last week was about 38 minutes. This one's going to be closer to about 50. So I apologize for that. But uh, off we go with everything that's happening in the world, I wanted to begin on on kind of a, a bit of a lighter note. <laughs> um, my son Jarrett today, when we had our some some uh, time with our family, uh, Jarrett prepared a talk and as part of his talk, he shared a little poem. I thought this is too good. I got to share it with you. It's out of a book called 101 Famous Poems. This was by a guy by the name of Edmund Vance Cook. It's called, How Did You Die? I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs. This is good, considering everything that's going on. Did you tackle that trouble that came your way with a resolute heart and cheerful? Or hide your face from the light of day with a craven soul and fearful? Oh, a trouble's a ton, or a trouble's an ounce, or a trouble is what you make it. And it isn't the fact that you're hurt that counts, but only how did you take it? You are beaten to earth? Well, well, what's that? Come up with a smiling face. It's nothing against you to fall down flat, but to lie there, that's disgrace. The harder you're thrown, why, the higher you bounce. Be proud of your blackened eye. It isn't the fact that you're licked that counts. It's how did you fight and why? So, just for fun, as you consider all the struggles that are going on, uh, Lord bless you to be able to bounce back up and be proud of those black eyes that we get along this bumpy road as we move forward collectively and individually. All right, let's begin. By the way, welcome to my, to my home. We're going to do this in a different format rather than in a classroom at BYU. We're just going to do it here. Um, forgive me for just uh, talking to you. Follow along in your scriptures, pause as needed, take notes. Remember that the, uh, the final exam will still be open scripture, open notes. So be sure to not zone out because there's, there, there are a lot of things in today's lesson that are just really profound for setting the stage for the, for the Savior's infinite atonement that we'll talk about starting on Wednesday. So join me in Matthew chapter 21. So let me share the screen here so we can um, be on the same page. Uh, Matthew 21. You'll notice in the heading, Jesus rides in triumphant into Jerusalem. Okay. So let me set the stage really, really quickly with just a couple of items here. Matthew's account will show you that he's over in Bethany and Bethphage on the other side of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And part of the miracle here is that he tells his two disciples to go and get this, this animal for him to ride on, the offspring of a donkey. Um, you'll notice here that in Matthew's account, they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon all to fulfill a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Here's the problem. Matthew's trying to convince the Jews, this, this Jewish audience, that Jesus is the Christ. And so he's the one who's constantly fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. So this prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9 talks about the king coming, sitting upon an ass, upon the colt, the full of an ass. So it's this dualistic prophesying technique of, of Old Testament prophets. And here it shows up as two. You'll notice in Mark and Luke and John, 
it only mentions one animal, the foal of an ass, which could be a donkey or a mule. I like the idea of a mule, and I'll tell you why in just a second, but it, it doesn't really matter which way it is. The point is, Joseph Smith is going to change this one in the footnote to be just the one as well. So, this Matthew account shows Jesus riding on two animals, which would make it look a little bit, a um, little awkward, a little silly, and uh, Joseph changed it to match up with Mark, Luke, and John's account. Now, here's the significance. Let me just show you what's going on here. If we open up the virtual New Testament, um, you will see here that in Jerusalem, here's the Mount of Olives right here, the top of the Mount of Olives. Bethany and Bethphage are over on this side of the Mount, and we know that there's a road in the first century that comes right down off of the top of the Mount into the Kidron Valley. Gethsemane is right here, a little bit to the north, on the other side of this Kidron Brook. You'll notice that as Jesus comes down, and if he comes down this way, down the Kidron Valley and into Jerusalem this way, then it would make a lot of sense because something else happened in this valley uh, many years previous. So Solomon, or sorry, let me rephrase that. David, if you, if you cross-reference Matthew 21, verse 9, verse 8 and 9, if you just make a little note in your margin to 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 32 and uh, 39 through 40, let me just show you this. Let me take you here. 1 Kings 1. Look at verse uh, 32. King David, by the way, in this chapter, 1 Kings 1, he's on his deathbed. He's ready to die. And his one of his wives, Bathsheba, comes to him and says, hey, I thought you were going to let our son Solomon be the next king. But Adonijah is setting himself up to be the king. So David says, okay, call Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Beniah the son of Jehoiada, and you're going to take my son Solomon, and notice what it says, have him ride upon mine own mule and bring him down to Gihon. Now the Gihon spring is right there towards the, the bottom part of the Kidron Valley. And that's where Solomon is supposed to be taken and put on his father, King David's best mule. And he's supposed to then anoint him king over Israel, blow the trumpet, saying, God save King Solomon. So they bring him down. They took oil out of a horn. They anoint him. And he, so, so look at the, the setup here. You have the king of, or the son of David, who's put on a mule at the Gihon spring. He's anointed, which the Hebrew word there, um, somebody who is anointed is, is a Mashiach, a, a Messiah. You anoint kings, you anoint priests, in the Old Testament, in this case, Solomon is anointed as the new king, the son of David. And he rides in. Now notice what happens. All the people, they blow the trumpet, and all the people say, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him in verse 40 and say, uh, the people piped with pipes, rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth rent with the sound of them. This is, this is like a, a huge crowd shouting and and hollering, hey, we've got a new king, Solomon, the son of David, is going to be our new king. Now, go back here, Matthew 21. We take this colt of an ass, which could be a mule, which makes beautiful symbolic connection back to 1 Kings 1. So here in Matthew 21, it says, that a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed after cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
this is important to understand that for years, for centuries, the Jews have been waiting, their, their messianic expectations have been that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to be a Davidic king. He's going to sit on the throne of David, King David, and it's going to be a descendant of David who's going to do this. They're all expecting Jesus in this moment based on what's happening here. They are repeating the process of Solomon's triumphal entry as the son of David, as the new king of Israel into Jerusalem. They're repeating that here with Jesus. Um, verse 9, this is a must-have cross-reference that you can mark in your footnote, Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26, or you can write it in the margin as well to draw even greater attention to it. This is, this is pretty profound because here's what's happening. Psalm 118 is one of many psalms that they sing. And for those of you who aren't aware of this, the psalms are simply the hymns or the, the, the songbook for ancient Israel. So when you go to church in the synagogue back in Jesus' day and you sing a hymn, you sing it out of the psalm book, out of the song book. So they have this, this set of songs that they sing at different times of year for different things different reasons, like we have our Christmas songs in the hymn book come from hymn number 201 to 214. That's just kind of where we are during Christmas. Our Thanksgiving ones, there, there are a few of them that are all clustered together. Our sacrament hymns are all clustered from 169 through 197. Um, Easter is 197 to 200. You get that idea. Same thing with the Psalms. From 113 to 118, those are the Hallel Psalms. Psalms. The, the word Hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L, -L -E -L, in the Hebrew means praise. These are the praise songs. And by the way, you see that in English. Um, think about the Hallelujah Chorus, or saying Hallelujah. Well, Hallel to Yah, Yahweh. It's praise Jehovah. That's what hallelujah is. Praise, praise God, praise Jehovah, God of the Old Testament. So these are the Hallel Psalms, and number 118 is kind of the last one in that block, and then the great Hallel is Psalm 136. But they sing these songs every year at the festival times when they when they gather for feasts and festivals like the feasts of passover or feast of the tabernacles pentecost the these are big praise kinds of psalms 118 is a messianic psalm that talks about the coming of the messiah it's this he, he's he's coming look at this look at verse um 25 Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Just so we're on the same page, save now. That's the English way of saying Hosanna. Hosanna means it's this petition from, from us on the earth to God on high saying, please save us now. We, we want salvation. So. Hosanna, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. And then notice this 26, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We've blessed you out of the house of the Lord, out of the temple. Um, if you look at that closely, what's happening is Jesus is riding down the Kidron Valley, probably past the Gihon Spring, to, to follow that pattern from 1 Kings chapter 1. And what are they shouting to him? Look back at the wording here. Hosanna, which means save now, to the son of David. Our messianic expectation is our Messiah is going to be the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It's pretty clear that they're looking at Jesus in this moment saying, Hey, you're it. It's Palm Sunday, so we're a week before uh, the resurrection. 
and Jesus is going to be going into Gethsemane that Friday night, so five days later after this event. So you kind of get an orientation of where we are in time. But here's the part that often gets overlooked. Look at what comes right before this, this beautiful segment about the, the triumphal entry and the coming of our Messiah. Look at verse 22. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus, the, the chief cornerstone, first has to be rejected and refused by the builders before he's going to become the head, head of the corner. And then right after the, the glorious praise uh, verses 25 and 26, you get verse 27. God is the Lord, which has th showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, which, which is going to be rejected. The people plead with him to be saved as they welcome him in and bless him in the name of the Lord. But first, the sacrifice has to be bound with cords, even to the horns of the altar. There's something hauntingly beautiful about what's going on there with that triumphal entry event with Jesus riding on that mule. And by the way, I have to just say, this is one of my favorite all-time uh, unsung miracles in the in the uh, life of Jesus. People don't usually talk about the triumphal entry as a miracle, but if, if you don't think it's a miracle, I want to challenge you to try something. Go to some ranch and ask if you can get on the back of uh, a young offspring of a, of a mule or of an ass, so of a donkey, and make sure that that donkey or that mule has never had a rider on it before. It's an unbroken animal, as we learned in one of the other Gospels. Get on that animal and then have that animal go down a really steep hill and into a valley and have this constraining place where this, this animal is carrying you on its back. And then have people come rushing in in this crowd in front and behind you, come rushing in and have them all shouting really loudly, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, have them waving palm branches in front of you and the animal, have them take their clothing and throw it down on the ground in front for this animal to walk on and see what your, what your donkey or your mule does. I can guarantee it's not going to be a pleasant experience, but in this case, our little donkey just keeps walking um, there's some beautiful symbolism there to us because you and I will at times feel like this donkey going into a realm that we, we've never been in before. We don't understand uh, all of the scary things that are coming upon us. And maybe some of you feel like that right now with the whole worldwide epidemic with coronavirus and the economy tanking and some of you having real questions about your future and the future of your loved ones and, and family members and friends and wondering where this is all going to go. I think we could probably learn some valuable lessons from that, uh, from that mule or that donkey in the world in which we live today, that as long as Jesus is the one who has the reins and he's taking us, we can go into a very deep valley some might even call it a valley of the shadow of death, and somehow still keep walking without going totally crazy as long as we trust Jesus and give him the reins. It's a pretty powerful triumphal entry story, which if you stop and think about that for a minute, we've, we've talked about the triumphal entry from a, a 2,000 year ago perspective, but Jesus wants to come into your life as well. And when he comes in, it will be a triumphal entry. Any degree that we let Jesus in is a triumph in, in the battle that we wage between our spirit and our natural, natural self to let Jesus in. Now, 
you'll notice in Matthew 21, the next thing he does is he goes into the temple and he's going to cast out the money changers. So, let me see. As he goes into Matthew 21, check this out. Verse 12, Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Um, there are lots and lots of people in Jerusalem at Passover time. Uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who come into Jerusalem at this time. And this temple would have been packed with people who were exchanging money and selling animals. And to be a good, a good Jew, a faithful Jew, I have to come in and change my money from my foreign land, wherever I've come in from. And what they're doing is they're charging me in unreasonable amounts to exchange that money for temple money so I can then go and buy the, the animals for the sacrifice. That's what Jesus seems to be really, really pushing back against is these people making money off of the masses of, of the crowds that are coming in trying to keep their religion and they're being ripped off like crazy. So you'll notice he overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Um, many people would say, Jesus, that doesn't sound very Christ-like without realizing that our God has a perfect balance of mercy and justice. That he's not always just walking around smiling at people, telling them, keep up the good work, don't change anything. There are times when you have to see the justice of God. When there's evil going on, then he, we see that judgment side of him here in this verse. And it's powerful. This is another one of my favorite miracles that doesn't often get talked about as a miracle. And if you don't think it's a miracle, then here's another challenge I, I give you. When all of these quarantines and all of this social isolation ends, and next time in the fall, you get an opportunity to go to a big sporting event or some big gathering. Try, try to kick out all the people who are selling concessions. And you, you have to do it all alone. And by the way, I'll let you have a whip to use John's account at the first cleansing of the temple early in his ministry. You can have one whip and see if you're able to do it. And then let's talk about whether or not this was a miracle that one guy was able to stand up to a whole group of people who are making an awful lot of money and he gets them to leave the temple and leave their their money and their goods behind as it's scattered uh this is a this is a miracle notice the fascinating thing that happens after that after he kicks out the money changers and the people who are ripping off these these jews verse 14 the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. That's beautiful. So you get Jesus coming in and kicking out people who are doing wrong things, and then once they're gone, then he welcomes in those who previously were not welcomed in full fellowship in the temple. They would have been seen as less. The other, the, the group that, that isn't worthy to be in, in our presence in the temple because clearly they've done something spiritually wrong. That's why they're blind or halt or lame. So Jesus lets them in. I think that's beautiful. Now, let's talk about you. Jesus wants to, to be allowed into your temple to cleanse you. Paul later on says, what? Know ye not that ye are the temple of our God? So the symbolism here runs a lot deeper than just Jesus kicking out money changers and those that sold the animals. It has to do with letting Jesus into to our temple, into our soul. And when he comes in, he doesn't come in and sit down and relax in a comfortable easy chair. When he comes in, he kicks things out. He cleanses our temple. 
And there's something powerful about realizing that I can't cleanse my own templates too big. There's too many things. I can't do this. But I know somebody who has the power to cleanse me. And he wants to cleanse me. But I have to be the one to let him in and invite him in. And once he's cleansed, then he invites things into my life that haven't been there previously that would be a great blessing to me. And he heals those. And uh, there's some beautiful, beautiful symbolism to how he's, he's not just dealing with a building, this big courtyard back then, but with sons and daughters of God today in the latter days. Now, the next morning in verse 18, jump down to 18, it says, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, so on the side of the road, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. And he said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. The Greek word there is immediately. It's kind of fascinating in, in Mark's account as they're walking home later that evening, they look at the tree and it is withered from top down to the very root. They can tell it looks totally dead and withered away. And he says, wow, that was fast. Um, this is one of the only times where you're going to see Jesus use his power to curse, to destroy, to, to take away life from this fig tree. We don't know exactly which one is right or which combination of order of events is accurate because Matthew, you'll notice this order. Matthew, you have the triumphal entry, cleansing of the temple, then he goes home to Bethany over the mountain again, sleeps the next day, comes back in the morning and curses the fig tree. Mark does it in a different order. He says, Jesus came in on the triumphal entry, went into the temple, looked around. The people clearly wanted him to go over to the Antonia fortress and overthrow the Roman garrison and give the kingdom back to the Jews, back to the Israelites. But he didn't do that. In Mark's account, he simply looked around, saw what was going on, went home to Bethany to stay. And then the next morning comes back to Jerusalem, curses the fig tree, then goes in and cleanses the temple. So Mark's timing is, is symbolically really quite beautiful because it looks like he's showing an object lesson of people who are showing all of the, the signs of, of righteousness. Look at me. I've, I'm, a, I'm a fig tree. Look at my leaves. Look at my branches. Look how big and beautiful and righteous I am. And he goes and looks in the tree and he can't find a single fig. And he says, you're cursed. And it's done. And then he goes into the temple, seeing a whole bunch of, of chief priests who are saying, look at us. Look how righteous we're being. But they have no fruits of righteousness and Jesus, in essence, curses them and sends them out. So you can kind of see that crossover taking place there. Now, earlier in the semester, of, uh, in earlier lessons, we covered the subsequent material in chapter, the rest of chapter 21 and chapter 22, and a lot of chapter, uh, actually, we didn't get into 23. So I just wanted to cover one thing in chapter 23. And it's Jesus' scathing rebuke against the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, look at verse 5. Jump over to chapter 23, verse 5. And you're going to see that he's condemning something here. This is speaking of the scribes and the Pharisees. All their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. This won't get you into heaven, but you might want to circle that word borders right there and write in the margin hem, uh, something to take you back to Matthew chapter 9, where the woman with 12 years of an issue of blood said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, then I'll be healed. It's the exact same Greek word as what got translated as borders here. So let me just show you really quickly what this looks like. Jewish people through the ages have taken very literally the statement from the Old Testament that talks about binding the word of God to your mind and to your heart. So they have these things called phylacteries. And inside of these boxes, these phylacteries, they have the words 
uh, specific passages from the Old Testament law written in Hebrew, and it has to be written perfectly. If you mess up, you throw that away and start over with a new, uh, a new piece of paper, and you roll them up, and you seal it up, and there's one that goes on your forehead, and you wrap it around, tie it, and then it come, the straps come down the front, and then you take one and you wrap it on your arm like this. So you put the, the phylactery here on your left arm and you can't have it on clothing. It has to be on your skin. Um, they take off their watch to do this or any jewelry and they put the words of God right there, wrap it three times and then seven times down the, the arm and then around and through the, the uh, fingers. And then they put on their prayer shawl. So this is a prayer shawl with a tzitzit. The tzitzit is the border, the hem. It's these little, all four corners of the prayer shawl have these, these uh, little borders and they have knots and then wound around. This is an important number. If you've zoned out, zone back in. This is really important to get. There are 613 laws, specific laws in the law of Moses. They have 613 wraps here, tied, tied, tied. If you add up all four of the corners, the, the numbers that they have, it comes out to, to be 613. Watch what Jesus is condemning, because some people would assume that he's condemning the use of phylacteries and prayer shawls. We need to be careful there, because he's not condemning that. He's condemning it when the, the Pharisees make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, as if to say to the world, look, look how much better than all of you, you commoners are. I am so much better at keeping the law of Moses. Look how much, how big the scriptures and the words of God are in my mind, in my heart, and how, how big my prayers are based on the length of the borders, the, these tzitzit, these, these tassels on my prayer shell are. That's what Jesus is, uh, is decrying here. He's saying, let's get rid of self-righteousness. Let's get rid of the appearance that I am so much better than you because of things that are really easy to do on an outward level, kind of like a fig tree. Look how many leaves I have. Look how much wood and branches I have. Look how big I am such an amazing fig tree, but there's no fruit growing. That's the problem. On the covenant path, it's not about appearances. It's about the heart. It's about where you're, who you're becoming. Okay. Now, let's shift over and grab a couple of things from John. So jump over to John chapter 13, and I'm going to try to keep this uh, fairly streamlined and fairly quick. If you, uh, if you hit John chapter 13 with me, let me, let me pop over there so I have it on the screen for you. So we can be together on the page here. In John 13, what you're noticing is this is the Last Supper. Uh, we're now on Thursday night, based on our time. This would have been Friday, based on Jewish time. Because the minute the sun goes down in the west, then the priests would wait to see, as soon as he can see three stars at the place of the trumpeting, he would signal this is the start of a new day. And you flip your calendar over. So this is now Friday for Jesus when they go in to have this Passover meal. I need to make this really clear. It can be kind of confusing, so pay attention and I'll try to keep this simple and straight. You have the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who all say that this is the Passover meal, which means the Passover lambs have all been killed in the temple throughout that day. And then once the sun sets, you can now gather with your family and have your Passover meal. John is an outlier. He says, no, no, the Passover meal is going to be the next night. Either way, I, it doesn't need to be an argument between Matthew, Mark, and Luke arguing with John and vice versa. There are beautiful symbols that can be gained from looking at either way. Just know that there's a little bit of a discrepancy there, and we've got to be okay with that. I love the symbolism from John's perspective that uh, if Passover is the next day, that means Jesus is going to be 
hanging on the cross and he's going to die the same day that in the temple you're going to be killing thousands maybe even tens of thousands of lambs. Josephus tells us 200,000 lambs, but we think his numbers are probably probably a bit inflated. Um, but either way, lots and lots of lambs are going to be dying the next day at the same time that Jesus is hanging on the cross and, and dying in the evening of the following day. But that, that's not the, uh, the end-all be-all issue here, the timing. Look at verse 2. Here we are. We, we're in the upper room, and it says, and supper being ended. This word here, ended, I want you to, to take some time and look up on Strong's. Get used to using Strong's. I'll just tell you that um, the word ended is probably not the best translation that the KJV translators could have used. In fact, most other English translations use something very different. And there are a couple of other options. I want you to pause the video and take an opportunity to look at that word. You Google Strong's, click on your first entry, which would take you to Elia, this blue letter Bible, and type in John 13, 2, and then click on the Greek number next to ended and look at the different ways that it can be translated and see what you think and then come back. Now, I hope you did that. Um, you've noticed that it's not just ended. That's probably the least likely translation. It's probably supper being started or just getting underway or was in the process of being eaten when Jesus stood up from the, from the supper, took his garment or laid aside his garments, took on a towel, girded himself, and then went around to begin washing his disciples' feet. If you look at most depictions in art, of the Last Supper, what that means, like da Vinci's famous Last Supper depiction, what that means is Jesus would have to be getting underneath the table and washing their feet. It's a, it's a bit awkward, uh, doesn't, doesn't fit really well, but if you look at the way Jesus was most likely seated or reclined around the table, it's a triclinium table, three-sided table where you, where you recline on your left elbow and you eat out of a center uh, table or tables um, out of common dishes, kind of like you would at a, at a Mexican restaurant when you go and get chips and salsa. They give you a bowl of chips and a couple things of salsa and people share. Very similar here. Many traditional uh, depictions put John here, Jesus here, Judas at his back, and Peter across the way. And that's that would make sense based on what's going on in the story later on, but we don't know for sure. But look at the washing of the feet. Look what happens if you're reclined at a table, how easy this is. And by the way, washing of the feet, that would probably be a job saved for probably your lowest of servants in your household. Go wash all those guests' feet. And don't be picturing feet like you and I would have. Picture feet from the first century of common people. That This would not have been a pleasant job. So Jesus comes around the, the circle, and by the time he gets to Simon Peter, Simon says, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? In verse 6, and Jesus says, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And G Peter's response is, nope, <laughs> you can wash everybody else's feet, but I'm not, you are not going to wash my feet. You'll never wash my feet, he told Jesus. And Jesus says, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. <laughs> and Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Just, just wash all of me. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, I, I just need to wash your feet and then you'll be clean. And by the way, this is an ordinance that was re restored in the latter days. If you read the last few verses of section 88 in the Doctrine and Covenants, you'll see that it is an ordinance that was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith, the washing of the feet. Beautiful. Now, jump down here to verse 21. Jesus is troubled in the spirit, and he testified, saying, one of you is going to betray me. At this point, they're all looking at each other going, wow, who, who's he talking about? In the synoptics, the question they ask is, Lord, is it I? 
instead of, oh, I know who it is. It's, it's definitely him. He's been acting really weird lately. I love the fact that, that in those other accounts, they're looking inward saying, is it me? And notice this, verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus's bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This would be John, the beloved disciple who happens to be writing this story, always speaking of himself in third person. Leaning on Jesus's bosom, if you're sitting at a table, that's really awkward. But if you're at a triclinium table, where you're leaning on your left elbow, eating with your right hand, it makes a lot of sense for him to lean back to Jesus to communicate and ask the question. So Simon Peter, across the way, beckoned to John, ask him who it is. He's just beckoning, kind of motioning. So he then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus says, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. So he probably takes a piece of unleavened bread, dips it in the haroset or one of the, the Passover elements at the meal there, dips it into the sop, and then hands it to Judas Iscariot. If you're reclining on your left elbow, your, your range of reach is really limited. So that's why most people, when they're depicting this, will put Judas Iscariot right behind Jesus, because we know John's right in front of Jesus. Um, that's a, that's a beautifully symbolic place for Judas to be. Judas, the ultimate backstabber in this context. I, I got your back, Jesus. And right after he gives him the sop, Jesus says, that thou doest, do it quickly. And no man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto them, unto him, because Judas had the bag. He's the, he's the treasurer of the 12. And they thought that Jesus told him, go out and buy the things that we need for the feast, which remember in John's account is going to be tomorrow night. So they just think, oh, Jesus just sent our treasure out to go and get things purchased for our meal tomorrow night. So then, this is, this is total personal opinion, but then I think it's when Jesus probably administers the sacrament for the first time with the remaining 11. Because he's pretty clear about that in the Book of Mormon. Don't administer the sacrament to those who you know are unworthy. It would feel weird if he had given that to Judas, but it's not going to ruin my testimony if he did. I just, I feel like he probably waited for that situation to end. And now he turns to the other apostles and says, okay, now... I want to introduce the sacrament to you, which you get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, not in John's. They, the synoptics don't talk about the washing of the feet, and John doesn't talk about the institution of the sacrament. Uh, you have to combine all the accounts to get that. Now, rather than covering all of that, I want to take you to a couple of other items here. Notice verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Can you just think with me for a minute through the progression of, of laws of concerning love? So the children of Israel are brought out of Egypt where they're living a law of lust. It's, they're, they're in apostasy, it's idol worship, and idol worship is also always associated with adultery back in the Old Testament. So lust. Then they're brought into the wilderness law of Moses is giving, given to them. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Then Jesus takes them to the Sermon on the Mount and gives them a higher law. Love your neighbor and love your enemy. And now a higher one. He says, a new commandment I give, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So it's no longer keeping track of who your enemy and who your friend is. You just love one another as Jesus loves, which is a perfect love. It's agape. It's charity. It's the pure love of Christ that isn't attached with strings to, I will love you if you do this, or I will not love you if you don't do this. It's just love one another. It's a pretty powerful invitation, not invitation, commandment that he gives to us. Okay. Then the last segment here. Simon Peter says, Lord, where are you going? I want to go with you, and I want to follow you now. And Jesus tells them, where I go, you can't follow, but you'll follow me afterwards. And he says, Lord, why can't I follow thee? I'll lay my, I'll lay my life down for your sake. 
And Jesus says, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake, Peter? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Um, there's been a lot said about this prophecy that Peter promises, I'll lay my life down for you. And we're going to see that later on in Gethsemane. And he, he's going to draw the sword. He, he really is willing to lay his life down. But Jesus says, actually, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. <laughs> and you get this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well. The wording's a little different there where it says, uh, especially in Matthew's account, thou shalt deny me thrice before the cock crows. Makes it sound almost like a command. I don't want to bore you guys to death, but there's something in English called the imperative and the indicative form of a verb. The imperative is a command form. You, you must do this. Thou shalt do this. The indicative form is just indicating what's going to be. It's like, I'll tell you what you're going to do. In English, thou shalt deny me thrice could be indicative or, or imperative or indicative. And we don't really know because it's thou shalt deny me thrice. But in Greek, it's a different word. And in all four Gospels, the Greek word here is not a command form. It's an indicative form. It's telling Peter, look, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. But this is going to be a beautiful learning opportunity for Peter. That isn't to belittle Peter. This is yet another opportunity for him to learn and grow and develop. Now, go over to chapter 14. We're going to end here with one more concept. Chapter 14. Look at verse 10. So they've been asking him, when are you going to show the Father to us? And Philip was, was voiced there in verse 9, 8 and 9. Notice verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. He's saying, look, the Father's in me. That verse, those two verses right there, are used all the time by people trying to say, see, the Trinity doctrine is absolutely pure in the modalist form, that it's one being with three manifestations, and it's the Father who's inside of me who's doing all of these works that you're seeing, okay? That's how, that's how this verse gets used. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to ever Bible bash or argue or make somebody feel like we need to contend with them over doctrine. That's a bad idea. But if you read this whole section, watch what happens. Jump down to verse 17. He's speaking now of the Comforter. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Notice the in you up here. The Father dwelleth in me and does all these things. Now he's saying the Comforter is going to dwell in you. Now look at verse 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my com commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. How do we know? Verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. It really is that simple. If we really love Jesus, we'll keep his commandments, and then we're promised this comforter. You guys, this is amazing because the whole rest of chapter 14, 15, 16 is all about Jesus. He's now getting moments away from Gethsemane, and he's passing the baton to his apostles to be able to survive without him being with them physically. And the baton that he's passing is beginning with an understanding of the Godhead and the role of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're about to get the Holy Ghost to be their constant companion, whereas up to this point, he's been their fairly constant companion in the flesh. But he knows the time is very short, and he's going to be leaving. And so isn't it beautiful that he says, Peace I live, leave with you, in verse 27. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. 
Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. <laughs> he's telling them that when he himself was moments away from going into Gethsemane. And he's worried about them feeling peace and not being afraid. The more I study the life of Jesus, the more in awe I stand of his, of his character. So as you go through chapter 15, 16 in your personal study, pay attention to how he's preparing them to receive the Holy Ghost as their constant companion soon. And now here's where we're going to end. Chapter 17, the intercessory prayer. We've walked out of Jerusalem up the Kidron Valley. We're now across the Kidron Brook from the garden called Gethsemane. And he looks up and he begins this, this intercessory prayer. Verse 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And then notice how he describes his relationship with Heavenly Father. Verse 11, now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now my favorite, verse 19 and 20. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these eleven alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. <sighs> Students, I, I miss seeing you in class. I miss having that opportunity to look into your eyes and look into your faces and be just inspired by your goodness and by your faithfulness. I hope that even though we've been at a distance and you've been seeing this in a recorded format, I hope you sense of the Savior's love for you, of the Father's love for you. I hope you've had the, the help of the Holy Ghost as we study these lessons and as you study your scriptures on your own, as you move forward into the unknown, even if we feel like we're, we're an unbroken donkey or a mule riding down the Kidron Valley, I hope you can feel the power of, of giving the reins to the Savior saying, I want to figure this out. I want to get it right in life. I want to become one with people around me as the Godhead is one, that they want us to all become one in them. That is the essence of at one meant that we're about to embark on in our next lesson as we go into Gethsemane and talk about the beginnings of the most important event to ever occur on this planet. Just know that God lives. Know that he is one with his son and with the Holy Ghost, and they want to share that oneness and that unity with us. And as we uh, finish this lesson today, I want you to know more than ever before that you're loved. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.